Recently, I did a climb with my duo on the NA server to see how high I could climb without losing a game. I did this because so often I hear, well, you're just going to have unwinnable games, even Faker couldn't win this game. So I wanted to test it out, I wanted to see if there really were unwinnable games. So I played 39 games from a completely fresh level 30 account, never had been played in ranked before, all the way to Diamond 4. I want to share with you what I learned from this climb and what you can learn from my climb. If you haven't already, make sure to check out our website, GameLeap.com. There we have hundreds of guides, all done by challenger players, sorted into a quick and easy to use courses system. We have courses both on the five fundamental roles as well as champion specific courses, so make sure to go check it out. Now, to address the question that is on everyone's mind first and foremost, do I think that unwinnable games actually exist? My answer to this is in the vast majority of ELOs, no, I don't think that any game is unwinnable. Now we did have two losses on the account and our teammates did not do well in those losses, but that's not the reason we lost them. We lost those games due to poor performance on our part. It had nothing to do with our teammates and we have had teammates that have performed significantly worse that we were able to carry. If we had taken our time and not rushed through the early games, we definitely would have been able to get a perfect win rate up until Diamond 4 without any losses. I'm not trying to say that you could win every single game in your own elo and your losses happen because of you. No, that is not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to eliminate the misconception that there is nothing to gain or learn from any certain game because it is quote unquote uncarryable by anyone. I also want to eliminate the misconception that you're not going to be able to stage a comeback because even in ELOs below Grandmaster, you will be able to in a lot of cases. There were a lot of games where me and my duo had to make a comeback due to the fact that we're not able to babysit our laners in the early stages of the game. If our laners did feed in lane, there's nothing we could do to stop that. The only thing we could try and do was shut them down after it happened. There are also times where we had to make plays like stealing Baron while split pushing. This is a type of play where you have to trust your duel immensely to be able to make the play, because if they're not able to and you're not there, it's going to be even worse off. Now with some of these things being said, I do want to kind of get into some tips that you will be able to use in your ranked games right now, right away without any practice. My first tip is for before you even queue for the game. Basically, you want to be feeling good when you go into the game. If you need to take caffeine in order to do this, be sure to do that. If you need to drink a glass of water so that you feel refreshed, do that. You don't want to be feeling sluggish going into a game as the first 10 minutes of that game are just going to be garbage for you and you're really not going to be able to play very well at all. Now the second tip is also for before you even queue for the game, and this one is really, really important. Remember, the name is Solo Duo Queue. If you want to have your best chances at winning games, you need to find a duo that you can trust. Now as far as finding a duo, it's really up to you and there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. Personally, I found my duo six years ago in a game of solo queue. When we first started playing with each other, we didn't even use mics for communication and it was a pretty rocky start, I'll be honest. However, after we started using voice communication and had a few years of practice under our belts, we quickly turned from random diamond players into one of the most potent duos on the entire server. In fact, pretty much any time that someone sees a Renekton Evelyn duo with a high win rate, it will be immediately assumed that it is me and Jez. We were able to become this good of a duo because we practice with each other. Now when we weren't able to play with each other, we played on our own and developed our solo play. When you are playing solo, it doesn't mean you can't still be improving your duo play as well. Look for things that your duo isn't doing that other players are. You can then use this information and feed it back to your duo, allowing them to improve their own play. The more you grow as a duo, the more synergy and trust you have, and the more you will be able to just naturally play off of each other. After playing with Jez for 6 years, it feels very natural to play with him and I don't need to call out a lot of the things that I'm thinking because he will be on the same page already. Getting comfortable with your duo allows you to eliminate a lot of the communication that you might need when you are more new to each other. If you do have somebody in mind like this, that's awesome because you just turned the 4 random solo queue teammates that you're going to get into 3 random solo queue teammates. This increases your chances tremendously, especially if that player is just as good as you are and just as focused on improvement. One thing that Jez and I will commonly do is we will watch back one of the VODs from our previous days of play to see what went wrong and what we did really really well. 
This allows us to test out a lot of new things really quickly and see what we are doing bad and what needs improvement. We can then focus on one or two things in our next game and really develop those things thoroughly. For example, if I'm getting ganked a lot, then we will watch the VOD back and see how I can ward better to dodge ganks. We will then come up with a game plan to see where I can be placing wards and how he can be helping me with vision. Once we have a game plan, we will try to put that into action in our next game and see whether or not it helped. Remember, just because we are challenger players does not mean that we don't make mistakes and it doesn't mean that we aren't looking to constantly improve. Now getting into Champion Select itself is where the game actually starts, and in Champion Select you just want to be making sure that your teammates aren't all autofilled. One or two autofilled members is okay, but having all three of your randoms autofilled is generally a no-go and you're just going to want to dodge that game. Feel free to look up your team using op.gg, that's the site that I use. It'll give you information on the win rates on all of the champions that your teammates play. If everyone on your team is locking in a champion that they have 20% or lower win rate on, it's probably best to just dodge and try again after the dodge timer is up in 5 minutes. Utilize dodging as much as possible to avoid any low quality games or any trolls that you might see. If we ever get into champion select and we see somebody that we might even think is trolling, we instantly dodge, we don't put up with that. Even if they are joking, it's not worth taking the risk in our opinion. Obviously you don't have to go to those extremes, it's up to you how much or how little you want to dodge, but dodging is a mechanic that does exist in League of Legends and it will help with your rank. During this climb, Jezza and I both wanted to just one-trick our accounts. This means I only wanted to play Renekton, and he only wanted to play Evelyn. Obviously, we could have played other champions if we wanted to, and we still would have had wins in lower elos. It wouldn't have been an issue. We wanted to be able to find a build before we started getting into elos that were going to be more competitive for us. Having two or three builds that you swap in between every single game is really, really good because it allows you to spend less time in the shop and just naturally build what you know you need. If you don't feel like one-tricking, you are going to be investing more time and thought into your builds, skill order, and your play. If that isn't a big deal for you, then don't worry about it, but if you are a player that wants to be completely focused on gameplay and that's it, I would highly recommend one-tricking something. If you don't want to play only one champion ever, one thing you can do is play one champion when you're looking to climb, and then when you're just looking to improve, you can work on your other champions. This will bring them up to speed for whatever elo you got yourself into by one-tricking whatever champion you decide to one-trick. This allows you to keep your diversity high while still being able to climb quickly. Now as much as you guys might dislike it, about 70% of the actual game occurs before you even load into Summoner's Rift. This is how prepared you are to get into the game, runes, summoner spells, champion selection, bans, the draft, all of these things are very, very important. By making the most out of these things, you are able to increase your chances of winning to the highest that they can be. Make sure you are mentally present during the pick and ban phase so that you are able to make the most of the pick and ban. You also don't want to load into Summoner's Rift with the wrong runes and summoner spells, and I know this is something you, yes you, I'm looking at you, have done personally before. The more attention you're paying during pick ban lowers the chances of this happening. Now once you've loaded into Summoner's Rift, it becomes very, very simple. Anything up until this point can be applied to every single role, but from this point on, I will be talking specifically about mid lane and jungle synergy due to the fact that that is what me and Jez played during this climb. The first thing that we did every game without fail is we always went to the same brushes. We did not go into a brush and then AFK, tab out, put on some music, maybe join a rabbit call, put on some anime, whatever it is. From the instant the game starts, not from when minions spawn, we are ready to play the game and we were present. We would pay attention and we would communicate to our teammates with pings what to do and what not to do. This makes it more likely that our teammates will also be present and paying attention because they're going to be wanting to know what are they pinging about. I always walked up towards the enemy tower. I didn't stay close to my tower when scouting. This allows me to get vision on any entrances to their jungle from mid lane. Jez would sit in the brush below me and typically one of our bot laners would sit in the pixel brush or the brush right next to it. This gives us as much vision as possible and protects both me and Jez, the main carries on the team. They aren't able to cheese either of us because we have protection from the vision that we have. 
If everyone on your team is AFK, I would recommend the same position, just a little bit closer to your tower, so you're not likely to get flashed on by the enemy team. Once minions have spawned and jungle camps start, you just play the game normally. Nothing is going to be out of the ordinary until level 3. If you can score a level 2 solo kill on your laner, then by all means go for it, but you're not likely to see this occur, it's probably not going to happen. The main thing that you want to be focusing on is by the time cannon wave comes to mid lane, you want to be getting priority and shoving that into the enemy tower. This will allow you to come to any scuttle fight that breaks out. Now me and Jez were in comms throughout the entire series of games, and through these 40 games or so, we probably played about 20 2v2s at Scuttle Crab. In these situations, we won every single one of them, and this is simply because we were in comms and we knew what the other's champion does. There were times when the enemy team got to the scuttle first, we were pushed in, they had summoner spell advantage, and we are still able to win simply because we were in comms with each other and the enemy team was not. We are able to quickly call out who we want to focus and be on the same page instantly. A lot of the time though, I was able to get priority in the mid lane by level 3, guaranteeing double scuttle for my jungler. Every time that he called for me on the scuttle crab, I would immediately go leave the wave. It's okay if I miss two creeps. If he calls for help, I go, I help him get the first scuttle crab, then we immediately path through mid lane together, push the wave together, and then we go to the other scuttle crab. This is something that you see in high elo all the time, even with players that aren't duoed, and this is simply because of how powerful scuttle really is. Now, if we aren't able to get the scuttle because we're playing against something like Graves or Hecarim, where it's just, there's no way we're able to contest them at the scuttle, that's fine. He's able to go back into his jungle, clear however he wants. He can also opt for a bot lane scuttle if he wants. It's entirely up to him how he passed from that point. If he does opt for the bot lane scuttle, my job is to chunk out the enemy jungler when they path through mid or make it so that they cannot easily path through mid. The only thing that you really need to do here is buy about 5 seconds of time, this will give your jungler enough time to finish the scuttle, and then you can back off. Now I realize in lower elo, scuttle fights might not happen, and in our lower elo games, they oftentimes didn't. In that case, it's free 2 scuttles for you. Remember, getting a double scuttle is more important than clearing one of your own jungle camps. Another thing that we would frequently do during this climb is Jez would tax a lot of EXP from my lane. Remember, jungle is the most important role in the entire game. If you're able to get a 2 level lead on the jungle while only sacrificing a 1 level lead in your solo lane, that is entirely worth it. It is especially worth it if you're going to be fine in your solo lane with a 1 level disadvantage and you're able to survive or even still kill the enemy mid laner. Once Jez and I were both level 6, that's when we started being able to play the game and start impacting the map for our team. Typically this would happen before 6 or 7 minutes, but sometimes it would take as long as 8 minutes to occur. It really does depend on how well or poorly the game is going for you specifically. Once we are both level 6, we look to roam together as much as possible. Any time that I return to the wave, he comes to gank mid. Any time that I leave, he goes to whatever lane I go to. The thing that dictates which lane I'm going to roam to is whichever side of the map my jungler has camps on. If the gank fails, he's able to easily go into his jungle and maintain the EXP advantage. EXP advantage on the jungler is the most important thing. You cannot be dropping your EXP advantage on your jungle matchup. Your job as the mid laner is to empower your jungler. That really is all there is to it. If you're able to become dominant enough in the jungle role, you will pretty much guarantee that the jungler will not get any objectives. This means no dragons, no rift herald, they're not going to be able to do baron, they're not going to be able to dive, sometimes they're not even going to be able to get their own buffs. You're able to completely eliminate the most important role from the enemy team just by helping your jungler out. Jess and I hardly ever take dragons, this is because it takes a lot of time to do them and it requires 4 people on them in order to do them efficiently. Oftentimes in lower elos, this just isn't going to happen, your bot lane is going to be more focused on farming, so it's better to just take camps and maintain the EXP lead and make sure the enemy team doesn't do the dragon. If the enemy team does start the dragon, what we will do is we'll just go to the dragon, kill them on the dragon, and then take the dragon. It is pretty much suicide to attempt a dragon while two levels down on the enemy jungler, so most enemy junglers understand this and they won't even attempt to make the dragon happen, but if they do, all the better for us. 
Now around 10 to 12 minutes into the game, I will start focusing on my own lane more. This is because I want to get at least three plates of gold. The first three plates are pretty easy to take, especially after a solo kill. At this point, we start looking to play toward mid lane much more heavily, kill the enemy mid laner, and then take plates together. If my jungler sees a gank opportunity or he has his own camps up, then he will leave me to get solo plates and look to get as much income to both of us as possible. Remember, sharing plates does not add to income, so it is a waste of your time. It's better to get your own camps than to share a plate with one of your laners. Once I've gotten three plates, I can look to either take the tower in its entirety or continue roaming depending on how hard of a mid lane matchup I have. Most of the time I will look to wait until plating completely falls off to even finish the tower. It's not really worth trying to kill a tower when your autos are only doing 60 damage to it. I find that three plates is as safe as you can get. You can't really push a fourth or fifth plates with 100% safety most of the time. Now, if the enemy mid laner is just fighting you and dying over and over and over again, you might be able to get five plates completely safe, but most of the time I only look for three and then continue to look for roams. Between 17 and 19 minutes is typically when a jungler that is behind will start to look for Rift Herald. For us, usually this was a desperation move and we would allow them to just start the Rift Herald before killing them and taking the Rift Herald for ourselves. Remember, if you're not in control of the game, it's very, very hard to do an objective like Dragon or Rift Herald, but a lot of people will still try and force it to happen. If you're able to constantly be aware whether or not they are on the Rift or Dragon, you will be able to get a lot of free objectives really, really easily. You should never allow a team that's behind to get an objective for free and you should always look to pressure it. This is where you are able to close out games the easiest. By allowing the enemy team to go for a desperation play and then snatching it out of their hands at last minute, you do two things. The first is you're going to absolutely crush their morale. Oftentimes they will just start a surrender vote off of that. The second is you take any chance that they had to get back into the game and you completely wipe it away, pushing your lead even further. Usually by 20 or 25 minutes, the game would just be over if the enemy team did not immediately surrender at 20 minutes. The later you get into the game, the more the game becomes about your mechanics in their entirety. Even though setting sideways is something that's very, very good for you to do and something that you can reliably do in higher elos, we were never able to do this. Oftentimes, if the game did get to 25 minutes, our teams would just be way too far behind to even last against the enemy team under our own towers. This means that we are forced to permanently group with our team and just play team fights without ever having a chance to set up side waves or split push. It was at this point where no amount of strategy could do anything and we just had to be good at team fighting. This is only in one or two games out of 40 though, that's a 5% chance that it came down to our raw mechanics. We were able to push our leads through other means. By having a fantastic duo, playing our champion select correctly, and playing the early map really really well, we were able to win the game just through those things in 95% of our games. Now we did have those two losses on the account like I did mention earlier, but I think if we tried it again we could do it with a 100% win rate now that we actually know what we're doing. Our first time trying, we went in completely blind, not knowing what to expect. We weren't used to the certain elos. We weren't even playing mid jungle at the start. We were playing top and jungle. After having learned all of this and having played through it one time with only two losses, I definitely think we can improve that and do it again, this time with zero losses. There is also a lot that you guys can stand to learn from these games. Remember, it did not come down to mechanical ability in 95% of our games. Mechanical ability is the only thing that does take a long time to develop and that not everyone can develop. Anything else, knowing the game, knowing how to play the movement, finding a duo, all of that stuff you guys can do right away really quickly. I don't want you guys to expect results as good as mine, you're not challenger players, and that's okay. If you are able to use these things just a little bit to your advantage, you will still be seeing a lot more success in your solo queue games. Playing the game as a mid jungle duel is one of the best ways to play the game, and if you're lucky like me, then you will also end up with a lifelong friend out of it too. I think ultimately this is where I won the most. My 37 and 2 record might be beaten by somebody else one day, but I will have a friendship that is going to last me a lifetime for sure. That about does it for today's video on how to make the most out of your mid and jungle duo. If you did enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like, because these accounts took a lot of effort from both of our parts to do. 
It was a ton of effort invested on our part, so if you did enjoy, leaving a like would be highly appreciated. For those of you who haven't already checked out our website, GameLeap.com, there we have hundreds of guides all done by Challenger players sorted into a quick and easy to use courses system. We have courses both on the five fundamental roles as well as champion specific courses, which we are constantly expanding upon and updating. I've looked through a lot of the content on there and I can honestly say that it's all very, very good high quality stuff. If that is something that interests you, you can sign up using the link in the description below. As always, I'm Panther. I hope you learned something valuable and I will see you in the next one.